In the 1940s, Walt Disney would take his daughters, Diane and Sharon, to Griffith Park on the weekend so that they could play on the park's merry-go-round. They would spend hours on the carousel, while Walt would sit on a bench eating peanuts. It was during one of these occasions that an idea would find its way into Walt's head. I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. This is when Walt came up with the idea of Disneyland. Or at least that's what he and his company would tell people for the next seven decades. Walt wasn't necessarily lying about his epiphany on the bench in Griffith Park, but Disneyland was not born out of a singular event. Walt, being a storyteller at heart, simplified the Disneyland story, just as he had come up with multiple versions of the tale of his creation of Mickey Mouse. The quaint story of a father wanting a place to play alongside his children was heartwarming and succinct, but the truer, bigger story of Walt's Park involved more time, people, and ideas. Unlike the short merry-go-round version of the Disneyland story, the longer version is less known and far less merry. And here it begins. In the 1940s, as Walt Disney sat on that bench, he was broken and depressed, and he had no idea what to do about it. In the mid-1940s, Walt Disney, the once passionate storyteller that had changed the landscape of animation, was as lost as he had ever been. It was worse than the days of the paper route in Kansas City, possibly worse than when he had lost Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Walt had arrived at this low point for multiple reasons. One, the strike of the studio in 1941 had destroyed any semblance of what was once his creative family. While Walt was an attentive father to his daughters, his focus was always the studio. He craved the creative working environment, but his bitterness after the strike was noticeable to his staff, both old and new. His skepticism of communist infiltration in his company and his general disdain for the studio after the strike had removed all of the excitement from his work which itself had gotten worse. The box office failures of Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi had nearly sunk the studio, and many animators were being drafted to fight in World War II. As a solution and as a showcase of his trademark patriotism, Disney transformed his studio into a propaganda machine for the U.S. government. Walt's enthusiasm for these films quickly waned, as the time restrictions and lack of profit weighed on him. While Walt had no trouble tapping into the minds and hearts of his audience during the Great Depression, he struggled to provide entertainment during and immediately after World War II. Walt had no feature-length animated films in the works, choosing instead to release live-action animation hybrid films or compilation films of animated shorts. Most of the financial issues fell on his brother Roy. Walt himself was unbothered. It seemed he just didn't care, which was not like Walt Disney at all. Finally, Walt had also given up on his passion outside of the studio, the sport of polo. Walt had become obsessed with the sport, but gave it up in the late 30s, partly due to an injury he incurred, and partly due to the fact that on two separate occasions, one of the people he was playing polo with died during the game. In less than five years, Walt had more or less lost his friends, lost his studio, and lost his hobby. Fortunately, he would soon find a means of escape from this rut, or at the very least, the lack of a pastime. Ward Kimball, the talented animator and trombonist, remained one of Walt's closest acquaintances, even while Walt distanced himself from his employees. This is for two reasons. First, Ward had not gone on strike against Walt in 41, and second, and more importantly, Ward loved trains, which was fantastic because Walt loved trains. Better yet, Ward had a train. In 1938, Ward had purchased a passenger coach and a locomotive not long after. He restored the engine and built a track in his backyard. It was operational by 1942, and Ward would host steam-up parties where he would invite friends and family to his house and operate the train for them. After learning of their mutual love of locomotives, Ward invited Walt to one of these steam-up parties in October of 1945, and even let Walt engineer the train through the backyard. Walt reached up and pulled the train's whistle, just as he had as a young boy in Kansas City, riding the train that surrounded Electric Park. Walt was transported away from his troubles at the studio and into a world of wonder. His passion was coming back, albeit in a new form. Walt's lifelong fascination for trains soon turned into an obsession. He was equally interested in both operating large locomotives and owning miniatures. 
In 1948, Walt and Ward traveled together to go to the Chicago Railroad Fair, a convention for train enthusiasts taking place in Burnham Park, the same ground that had held the 1933 Century of Progress Fair that Walt had visited 15 years prior. Ward observed a happy, childlike Walt, running around the convention space, overwhelmed with excitement. Walt was having the time of his life, but he was also ingesting major sources of artistic inspiration. Many of the miniature railroads at the fair were presented alongside elaborate models that the trains could navigate. These themed miniatures were detailed displays of everything from the Old West to Native American villages to the streets of New Orleans. As obsessed as Walt was with the trains, he seemed to be equally interested in the models. The attention to detail that the artists had for their miniatures was similar to the perfectionist nature he had once had for his animation. The color, the architecture, the placement, it was both reminiscent of and better than real life. On the way home from the fair, Ward and Walt stopped at Henry Ford's museum in Greenfield Village in Detroit, said to be the first outdoor living museum in the country. Walt, who had visited the village once before, took in the scale of the exhibit, which was focused on showcasing America's history and ingenuity. It was as if the models he had viewed in Chicago had been constructed in full scale, and the village's emotional story of Walt's country and its people was equally inspiring. When Walt finally returned home with Ward, he was more involved in his love for trains than ever before. The next year, he would build a new house for his family, as well as construct a miniature, rideable railroad around the property, much to the dismay of his wife Lillian, who had plans for a garden. It was named the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad, and it was Walt's pride and joy. A guest of the Disney residency could not avoid a trip on the line, engineered by Walt himself. And even with the Carrollwood Pacific and his miniatures, his obsession could not be contained. He needed something bigger, and he knew just where to put it. At Walt Disney Productions in Burbank, there was an empty plot of land on the other side of Riverside Drive that Walt had been eyeing from as early as 1940. Many fans of Disney wished to tour the studio, and Walt believed that a studio tour paired with some sort of attraction on the Riverside plot could be a lucrative side venture for Walt Disney Productions. It wasn't until the late 1940s, after Walt had become properly obsessed with trains, that the Riverside attraction concept was given serious thought. Walt's immediate vision was a small village with a locomotive track surrounding it, but this simple concept would soon grow in size and scale. Walt continued to take his daughters to Griffith Park, viewing the area from a new way, observing what worked and what didn't from a logistics and entertainment perspective. He would also spend significant time at Beverly Park Kittyland, gathering similar information, and asking the amusement center's owner, David Bradley, specific questions about operation. At the same time that he formulated his ideas for the Riverside Park, he furthered his interest in miniatures with a new project he called Disneylandia, which would be a line of visual jukeboxes that children could insert coins into and watch a small scene of miniatures play out in front of them. The project wouldn't make it past its first exhibit, but it was just another example of Walt's newfound passion for alternative entertainment experiences. To much of his staff at Walt Disney Productions, it was further proof of a distracted Walt. There was a growing sentiment in the studio that Walt was too busy with his toys to care about animation, which by many accounts was true. Walt even lacked interest in the studio's 1950 feature, Cinderella, which critics and audiences praise as a return to form for the studio. Worse than the ambivalence toward the animations, Walt was stealing some of his best artists to help him with his trains and village concept. On top of Ward Kimball, Walt had recruited a mechanical engineer at the studio, Roger Brogy, to help him with the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad and the train for the Riverside Drive Park. Also, animator Ken Anderson was directed to draw concept art for Walt's Disneylandia models. Walt had a new passion, a new hobby, and he was putting together his new creative family. In 1951, Walt went on a European vacation, on which he had the opportunity to visit Tivoli Gardens. The amusement park and pleasure garden hybrid, over a century old at the time of Walt's visit, was immaculate. The park had elaborate theming throughout its areas and integrated into its rides, and it was rid of any sense of the carnival atmosphere that plagued amusement parks in the U.S. Tivoli Gardens was designed to evoke emotions, and it did so impressively. Tivoli communicated serenity in one area and excitement in another. More than anything, it was beautiful. While Walt's Childhood Park, Electric Park, and Bradley's Kittyland were kept clean, especially in comparison to the other parks of the day, Tivoli was a destination. Its structure and layouts were attractions in their own right. The park's founder, George Karstensen, once said, quote, Tivoli will never, so to speak, be finished, a sentiment that Walt admired and took to heart. Walt believed he could build upon Electric Park, the Railroad Fair, Greenfield Village, and Beverly Park Kittyland, but Tivoli Gardens was a standard of quality he would strive to achieve. Also on his European tours, Walt would enter a model train shop in London. He found a miniature line that he was interested in purchasing, and found another man that was hoping to buy the same set. The other potential buyer also turned out to be an American, a man named Harper Goff. Walt introduced himself, and after learning that Goff was an artist, Walt told him, quote, When you get back to America, come and talk to me. Walt then bought the train before Goff could and left. Goff did as Walt demanded, and when he returned to the U.S., Walt assigned Goff to the Riverside Drive Park, 
which had grown past a mere village into a full-themed amusement park that he was calling Mickey Mouse Park, sometimes referring to it as Mickey Mouse Village. He wanted Goff to design the park's layout and create its concept art. Goff listened to Walt's ambitious ideas, and then went to work fitting as many of them as possible onto the small plot of land next to the studio. Mickey Mouse Park would have had its entrance on the corner of Buena Vista Street and Riverside Drive, with a parking area across the street. The guests would enter through the park's carnival section. This would have likely been very similar to Beverly Park Kitty Land, with classic kitty rides in a carousel. The path then split into two. If guests continued past the fairgrounds, they would enter New Town, a town square with a train depot for the park's railroad. This would have consisted of more shops and restaurants. Newtown closer resembled the turn-of-the-century small towns of the U.S., like Disney's own Marceline. Walt described the area as a village green. He explained, quote, In the park will be benches, a bandstand, drinking fountains, trees, and shrubs. It will be a place for people to sit and rest. Mothers and grandmothers can watch over small children at play. I want it to be very relaxing, cool, and inviting. There was also to be a town hall that functioned as the park's administrative office, as well as a functioning fire station and a police station, which Walt said would, quote, be put to practical use. Here the visitors will report all violations, lost articles, lost kids, etc. In it we could have a little jail where the kids could look in. We might even have some characters in it. Also in Newtown was a church graveyard with a haunted house attraction at the top of a hill. Past Newtown was Old Town, which would have resembled the towns of the Old West. Old Town had three signature attractions, the Old Mill, a Ferris wheel that resembled a water mill, the Mill Pond, a water ride where children could ride in ducks around the Old Mill, and the Gravity Flow Canal Boat, a boat ride that took up a significant portion of the park's space. At one point, the canal boat would zoom into the mouth of Monstro from Pinocchio. The plans for the park state that a castle was meant to be in the boat ride's vicinity, possibly a site that guests would travel to on their voyage. After Old Town was Granny's Farm, a petting zoo and livestock area based on the 1948 film So Dear to My Heart. In this section of the park, there was supposed to be the Dwarves' House from Snow White, which Walt had already recreated for the film's premiere in 1937, one of the first reported times he mentioned wanting to build an amusement park. After Granny's Farm was the Indian Village, a recreation of a Native American settlement. Looping around all of these sections was a horse and cart track that would transport guests throughout the park. The rest of Mickey Mouse Park would hold the park's river. A Mississippi steamboat would circle the waters, giving views of a lighthouse and Skull Rock from Disney's then-upcoming film Peter Pan. The boat would presumably take guests to the island in the middle of the lagoon, which would act as a bird sanctuary and walking trail. There was also rumored to be a donkey ride, a submarine ride, and a spaceship replica. Walt even considered bringing in Bradley's Little Dipper coaster to entertain guests. Another rendering showed a river that wrapped around the main park, with a bridge to allow guests onto the island, where Old Town, Granny's Farm, and the majority of the rides were located. Walt's obsession with the park grew consuming family dinners and animation meetings. Not only were the plans for Mickey Mouse Park a major step toward Walt's eventual amusement park, but it was also a furthering of Walt's growing personal nostalgia. At the time, Walt's yearning for his childhood in Marceline had grown from reminiscence to obsession. On top of the obvious nods to the setting of his childhood in Mickey Mouse Park and his rekindled fascination for trains, Disney's 1948 film So Dear to My Heart was sufficient proof that Walt's fixation on the better parts of his childhood had turned from nostalgic to mawkish. Mickey Mouse Park, with its western town, turn-of-the-century Main Street, and native village was to be a physical manifestation of Walt's personal nostalgia, and like Greenfield Village, a showcase of national pride. However, critics of Walt's Americana would label it not as patriotism, but as revisionism. Through some of his films and his park, critics would accuse Walt of presenting a false narrative of history, a stripped-down, sanitized, glorified, and romanticized American story. Old Town drew from the aesthetic promoted by Buffalo Bill Cody and his Wild West show, the same themes and images that were then integrated into films and TV. These representations in media and Mickey Mouse Park's Old Town praised the ruggedness of the frontiersmen, while ignoring the atrocities of the U.S.'s westward expansion. New Town showcased American life and community, again praising the positive ideals of the small town while ignoring any of the negative ones. Because of these simplified and inaccurate representations of the past, Walt would be labeled as a revisionist and a negationist. But to say that he was purposefully trying to alter the historical narrative might be giving him too much credit. By his and his collaborators' accounts, Walt's love of cowboys, horses, trains, farm animals, and small towns was not complex. It was merely the sights and images of his own childhood. With Mickey Mouse Park, he was creating a space for him to relive his fond memories of the past. He was creating what he knew in its simplest, best form. With the park, that simplicity would at the same time be both the core of his critics' arguments and one of the main reasons for its eventual success. 
Most of Walt's ambition with his films was constrained by two things, money and time, but a third factor was introduced with his visions for Mickey Mouse Park. Space. The riverside plot of land would only provide around 10 acres, and Walt went back and forth with two consulting architects he had hired about fitting all of his ideas into the small piece of real estate. Roy was concerned with the idea for all of its constraints. According to historian Jim Corcus, Roy wrote, quote, Walt does a lot of talking about an amusement park, but I think he's more interested in ideas that would be good in an amusement park than in actually running one himself. Walt was adding more people onto the project, including John Cowles, the son of Dr. Cowles that had funded Walt's cartoons in Kansas City. The park was in a constant state of flux, reflected in an apparent name change in 1952. At some point, everyone working on the project had stopped calling the park Mickey Mouse Park and had switched to using the name Disneyland, inspired by Disneylandia, Walt's now defunct model project. On March 27, 1952, the Burbank Amusement Park proposal was announced. The park would cost $1.5 million, and Walt believed he could use the park as a filming location for television events to offset the cost. Walt was now fully invested in making his project a reality. Walt's distance from the studio was so absolute that in December, he would create a new company which would be given the name Wed Enterprises, after his initials. This company would be tasked with creating Disneyland and its attractions. Walt hired one of his animation writers, Bill Cottrell, as the new company's first employee, who got to work creating the storylines for the dark rides. Art director Dick Irvine would soon join the team, as would Harper Goff, layout artist John Hench, and animator Mark Davis. Walt reportedly exclaimed to the latter, quote, Damn it, I love it here. What is just like the Hyperion studio used to be in the years when we were always working on something new? Walt was back. In September of 1952, six months after the Burbank proposal was announced, Walt, Goff, and Cowles went to present their concept to the Burbank City Council Board, hoping to acquire an additional 20 acres to build the park. The board refused on the grounds that they wanted to avoid a carnival atmosphere in the city. Walt pleaded that, quote, although various sections will have the fun and flavor of a carnival or amusement park, there will be none of the pitches, games, wheels, sharp practices, and devices designed to milk the visitor's pocketbook. Out of everyone, Walt wanted the park to resemble a carnival the least, but he could not convince the board, who stood by their rejection of the proposal. Walt, Goff, and Cowles were sent away. Walt's lingering paranoia toward members of his animation staff led him to believe that the Burbank City Council had been swayed by animators upset at Walt's newest distraction from the studio. However, the rejection was not the crushing blow that it might appear, as in the few months between the project's announcement and the City Council's rejection, Walt had already considered moving his plans away from the tiny studio plot. He knew that Disneyland was bigger than a studio attraction. Roy, seeing that his little brother was serious about the project, and feeling the constant need to protect him from the consequences of his own ambition, was now actively assisting in the park's creation. Roy supported the idea of purchasing a larger plot of land for the park outside of Burbank. With the help of his brother and the small team he had acquired, Walt removed the borders of the Riverside Park and allowed his plans for Disneyland to grow. A year later, in September of 1953, Walt recruited Herb Ryman, an art director who had left Disney Studios for 20th Century Fox years prior, to help draw concept art for Disneyland. Working under a tight deadline, Ryman produced the first full layout for Walt's new version of the park. He envisioned a park with a singular entrance and exit, a main street, themed to a turn-of-the-century town, based on Marceline and the new town concept from Mickey Mouse Park. To enter, guests would have to pass under a railroad station. They would have a view down Main Street to the park's central hub and icon, the Fantasyland Castle. The park was separated into various lands, such as True Life Adventureland, based on Walt's nature documentaries, Lilliputian Land, a world of miniatures, Recreation Land, a small park and picnic area with a dance pavilion and bandstand, another concept taken from Mickey Mouse Park, Frontier Country, a large Old West town that expanded on the Old Town concept with stagecoaches, Granny's Farm, a riverboat, and a Pony Express ride, and the Mickey Mouse Club on Treasure Island. This would serve as the filming location of the Mickey Mouse Club television show, a program taking inspiration from the local fan clubs across the country. The club's meeting place was to be housed inside a large hollow tree. There was also Holiday Land, a multi-purpose space for events and festivals. The new Disneyland was over four times the size of Mickey Mouse Park. The Burbank Park would have required about 25 acres, while Ryman and Walt's new park would need about 100. To find the land for Disneyland, Walt was introduced to Harrison Buzz Price, a surveyor at the Stanford Research Institute. Walt tasked Price to search for a location for his park. Also from Stanford, Disney would recruit C.V. Wood, an engineer and community planner that would assist in designing the park's layout. Wood became Disneyland's first employee. At the same time, Walt was continuing his research, if not increasing it. A few months prior, he had embarked on another European trip, this time stopping at the Netherlands Maduradam, which had an extensive showcase of miniatures. 
Walt would reportedly also visit San Francisco's Playland at the Beach, where he would recruit the owner's son, George K. Whitney Jr., to consult on the park and direct ride operations. Beverly Park Kitty Land owner David Bradley was now helping Walt more and more, leading the effort to prepare a 1922 carousel for operation at the park. Bradley would also suggest that Walt lower the buildings on Main Street so that visitors would not feel overwhelmed. Harper Groff would join Walt on trips to the nearby Knott's Berry Farm, where Walt had a casual acquaintance with Walter Knott. Walt and Goff studied the park inside and out, measuring walkways and studying crowd flow. He also studied Bud Hurlbut's park in El Monte, and on a trip to New York that summer, had a discouraging revisit to Coney Island, in which after seeing the rundown park, exclaimed, quote, I'm almost ready to give up on the idea of an amusement park after seeing Coney Island. This whole place is so run down and ugly, the people that run it are so unpleasant. The whole thing is almost enough to destroy your faith in human nature. His frustration was short-lived. A trip to Oakland would find Walt at Children's Fairyland, where he would recruit the park's director, Dorothy Maines, to serve as the youth director at Disneyland. Throughout the early 50s, most of Walt's team was traveling to parks throughout the country, taking notes. Some believe that there was no park in the U.S. that a member of the Disneyland team had not studied. Buzz Price, searching for a new location for Disneyland after the Burbank rejection, narrowed the options to Orange County, south of L.A., where the city was naturally expanding. He then narrowed the search further to a 160-acre parcel in Anaheim, mostly populated by orange groves. The land only had 17 owners and the price was affordable. Walt jumped on the opportunity, buying the land for just under $900,000. And this is where the common narrative resumes. The Disney-fied version of the Disneyland story often omits the many parks that inspired the first true theme park, as well as the many iterations that Disneyland itself went through. The Disney version of the Disney story has a simple beginning, of a father on a bench wanting to play with his girls, is a simple conflict, of an idea that no one thought would work and an opening day with too many people, and a simple conclusion, of a park that changed the landscape of entertainment. It is not technically false, but it is not holistically true. Similar elements can be found in Disneyland's version of American history. Walt's simple vision of the past would be seen by some as innocent, others ignorant, but no one could deny its power. Walt's greatest strength was his ability to tap into his audience, and for a brief period of time, he had lost that skill and had lost himself. In the Great Depression, the country needed escapism, and Walt provided it. But during the chaos and pain of World War II, and while Walt grappled with his own personal issues, he no longer had the answer his audience wanted. But now, with a booming economy and a new standing in the world, the U.S. needed more than escapism. They needed identity. And while Walt might have only been searching for his own, he had found the answer for many more. The Walt Disney view of America was of hardworking individuals, small town values, and optimism. Walt's Park would be a reflection of this image, a land dedicated to the ideals, dreams, and hard facts, give or take, that created America. However, Disneyland had expanded past Mickey Mouse Park. It was no longer just about the past. Where America had come from is just a part of Disneyland's narrative, for Walt was also going to give the country a vision of where they were going. With the same principles used for his version of the past, a foundation of simplicity and optimism, Walt was shaping his own world of tomorrow.